Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless i did not want jesus to be my god i never even thought that he would be jesus was a cuss word and yeshua was his name i go to sleep one night and i hear my mother waking me up and saying Liat, kumi kumi yeshua o mashiach she says, wake up, wake up, Yeshua is the Messiah. Hi, my name is Liat. I was born and raised in a, a suburb of Tel Aviv in Batyam. Right after I finished my military service, I decided to travel to the United States. And then I met my husband, who was uh, not Jewish, but it didn't, it didn't matter to me. There was a connection. We both were seeking God. Everybody in the family was worried. How are you going to raise kids? And you know, where you're Jewish and he's Christian. and But I was very stubborn <laughs> and I was convinced that you can do it if in a spiritual way where we just both respect each other's holidays and each other's practices and all that. He really respected, you know, my choice to to seek spirit, my spiritual roots and to understand them. You know, our son was turning 13 and I really wanted him to be bar mitzvah. So the only place that let us have his bar mitzvah was an Orthodox Jewish organization. They were so sweet and they were so welcoming and I thought maybe that's what I need to do. I need to become more like an Orthodox Jew because they seem to know what they're doing. They know how to pray. They know, they know God. The kids would go Sunday to church and Saturday to Orthodox synagogue. You know, I started to realize at some point toward the end of this experience, there were some things that were strange. Well, first of all, I had a conversation with the head rabbis and he told me that I have to divorce my husband. And I had a beautiful marriage besides this religion issue that was growing bigger and bigger as a monster in our family. We had love for each other and we were raising children and I didn't want to divorce him. Other boys, when they go out to read from the, the Torah, they would call out their names like Shimon, the son, the son of Abraham. And when my boys would go out to the Torah, they would say, They would say, Noach eh, Eliyahu, the son of Liat. Slowly I realized that as far as they're concerned, Greg, my husband, doesn't count as their father, and that was very hurtful. I went to Judaism to find God, and I didn't find him through all these rituals. And so I had this voice telling me, this is not God. I love my people so much and I wanted to belong to them so much. But I had a feeling and I knew that I'm never going to be in a place where the father of my children is not welcomed. So I still needed God. I did not want Jesus to be my God. I never even thought that he would be. So I developed this other God. I said, okay, I'm going to have something spiritual. It would be love, justice, honesty, and beauty. I really try to convince myself that that's gonna be my God. And something in me in my life was breaking while my husband is really starting to develop this big faith in Jesus. He comes to me and he tells me, Liat, I believe in the same God that you do. I believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So I told him, well, if you do believe in the same God that I do, why can't you just be Jewish? Why can't you just forget about Jesus and all this stuff and be Jewish? And then we can just have a wonderful life together. And in the house, Jesus becomes the enemy. Every book that he buys or he, he reads, you know, if I see it, I turn it around or I stuff it in a drawer. He starts hiding it. 
He's learning and reading uh, in secret. Here I am, I'm saying the father of my children is not going to be rejected. I am starting to reject him. I'm, I'm rejecting him. I'm hitting a place where I'm working really hard to be good, but I'm realizing that I'm really not good at all. The God that I invented is not saving me. I need someone to save me from this, and I don't know how, and I'm breaking down. I go to sleep one night, and I hear my mother waking me up and saying, Liat, kumi, kumi, Yeshua o Mashiach. She says, wake up, wake up, Yeshua is the Messiah. That morning I woke up, I just, something changed me. I, that was not a dream. I know it was not a dream because, first of all, I didn't know who Yeshua was. I never heard that name. But I know she was talking about Jesus for some reason. I didn't know who was it. And then the next night I go to sleep and uh, and, and Greg was telling me, Liat, you're yelling Yeshua, Yeshua through your sleep. I knew that what he was saying was right. I just was afraid, you know, that he would, what is he going to think about me? I told him, I think I believe in Yeshua. And the next night I went on my knees and I said, Abba, Adonai, if this is true, could you give me one more dream? <laughs> I don't know. I just, I said, could you give me one more dream? And I went to sleep and I had one more dream. <laughs> and I woke up and I knew, I said, this is it. I know that Jesus was, is my Messiah. And then I knew that that was what was missing that in that fork that I arrived to, is that I was bad. And and it was not that I was bad. I didn't, I knew that I was not a murderer. I was not a thief, but I could never be on that level that is expected of me. No matter how much I tried, no matter how I exhaust myself, I couldn't. And that I needed, I needed a Messiah. I needed someone to save me from that. And the first thing that I did that I woke up that morning after my third dream, is I wrote in Hebrew. I went to the computer. I didn't want any American, any English speaking person to tell me about Yeshua. So I went on the computer and I wrote in Hebrew, Lama Yeshua. And I wrote, why Yeshua? And one for Israel came. And one for Israel, and all one for Israel's angels started to explain to me things that I didn't understand. You know, one of my biggest fears was that I will not be, that I will lose my Judaism because I love being Jewish. They explained to me how Jewish believing in Yeshua is. And I did, you know, for the first time in my life, I finally felt more Jewish than I've ever felt in my life. All of a sudden, also the gap between me and my husband was gone. I felt like, wow, I can see so clearly now. I was just a new person. I went to sleep hating Jesus. I woke up loving Yeshua. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. God to this very day has blinded the Jewish people in part to the gospel of Jesus Christ for their disbelief. Romans 11, 7 and 8. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear to this very day. Romans 11.25 For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Blindness is the Greek word perosis, which means stupidity or callousness. 2 Corinthians 3.14-16 But their minds were blinded. For until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. One of the many signs we are living in the last days is that God is starting to lift the blindness to the gospel of Jesus Christ for the Jews. In biblical Old Testament times, 
the Jewish people were looking for a political, military messiah who would save them from years of oppression by foreign nations. Because Jesus didn't fit their idea of who the messiah was to be, they rejected him. In turn, God gave the Jewish people a spirit of stupor and callousness toward the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus came the first time not to be a political, military leader, but as a servant and savior of mankind. When Jesus returns the second time, he will set up his monarchy on earth, and now will be the political, military savior the Jews were looking for, ruling the nations with a rod of iron, as we read in Revelation 19, 11-16. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God, and the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is a prophecy concerning the Jewish people that must be fulfilled in order for Jesus to return found in Matthew 23, 37-39. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The coming seven-year tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation in which the Jewish people will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. They will receive Yeshua as their Messiah, and they will cry out, Baruch, Abba, Bashem, Edne. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What a glorious day that will be. What glory it will bring to the name of God. Hebrews 12.2 Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Are your eyes fixed on Jesus? He is returning. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Second Corinthians chapter 8, verses 7 through 15 from the Inclusive Bible Translation. That just as you are rich in every respect, in faith, in discourse, in knowledge, this is the word of God for the entire world. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, y'all. My name is Russian Kimball. My pronouns are he, him, his. I have the pastor of serving. I have the privilege of serving as the pastor of Broadway United Methodist Church in downtown Orlando. And also my... Um, also, my uh, drag name is still a work in progress, so if you have any ideas, just uh, please let me know. There's one floating around, but we'll, uh, we, I'm not going to share that one with you. So, together is the key word here, because I could not be where I am today without community support. I could not be the proud gay man serving as a pastor of a United Methodist congregation in, in Orlando and Florida in the South without having long-standing allies in the work of inclusion, such as Pastor Andy. This is no masquerade. This is me. A man who loves to preach about Jesus, is openly gay, and has a side he's never shared before. Until today. Yeah. 
as a sign of his coming and the end of the age. Jesus said there would be a falling away from the Christian faith, and false teachers would rise up, as we read in Matthew 24, 10 and 11. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. The Bible tells us these false prophets will twist God's word, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, as written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. The Bible goes on to tell us that these false teachers are Satan's servants, as we read in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. The last days church will not follow the truth in the Bible. They will find false teachers to tell them their sin is okay. And not just that it is okay, but it is biblical, as we read in 2 Timothy 4, 3, and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. This is what last day's Christianity looks like. It is a Christianity that says there are many paths to heaven. When the Bible clearly says, Jesus Christ is the only way, it is a Christianity that approves of homosexuality, fornication. If you are having sex, and you are not married, it's not called dating, it's called fornication. And abortion, even though God says these things are sin, it is a Christianity that in its church services look just like the world. Jesus goes on to tell us the last day's church will be such a worldly, Christ-rejecting church that he has been thrown out, as we read in Revelation 3.14-22. through 22. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold, refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In these verses of scripture, Jesus is talking about the last day's lukewarm church, a church that has one foot in the world and one foot in the church. This church is so disgustingly lukewarm that Jesus vomits it out of his mouth. Jesus counsels the last day's church to buy from him gold, which is purity, white garments, which is righteousness, and I salve, which is truth. These three things can only come from the purity, righteousness, and truth that Jesus offers through salvation in him. Jesus is now standing outside the door of the last day's Laodicean church, offering salvation to anyone who will listen. This is the grace and mercy of God. He has been kicked out of his own church, and yet still knocks and offers salvation to anyone who hears his voice and opens the door. I implore you today, if you are not saved, or are a lukewarm Christian, to take up Jesus' offer of salvation that can only be received through him and only him. John 14.6 Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is an absolutely unbelievable story. The Biden administration is pressuring Israel to make more concessions for a ceasefire and hostage deal. 
even though Hamas still hasn't shown up at the negotiating table. And now the terror group's leader is insisting Israel give him a personal guarantee. CBN's Chuck Holton explains. Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar has reportedly added a new demand to ceasefire negotiations, his own survival. An Egyptian official told Israeli media that Sinwar wants assurances he won't be killed, despite previously stating he'd be proud to die fighting Israel. This as cracks may be forming in Palestinian support for the terror leader. On Tuesday, a Gazan woman interrupted a live Al Jazeera English broadcast shouting, May Allah curse you, Sinwar and Hamas. She was immediately hauled away by an unidentified man. Meanwhile, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu insists on maintaining an IDF presence along the Philadelphia corridor at the Gaza-Egypt border. In a phone call Wednesday, President Biden reportedly pressuring Netanyahu to soften his stance to help get a ceasefire deal. But with the IDF having found and destroyed 150 tunnels there, Israel believes it must guard the corridor to permanently end Hamas threats. We are prepared for any scenario, both in defense and attack. Tehran claims that their delay in this massive response that they've promised for the killing of Ismail Haniya is part of their strategy for punishing Israel, but Israelis remain largely unfazed. The delay in Iran's execution of this attack has caused a lot of Israelis to just engage in a sort of cautious optimism that perhaps the attack won't be coming at all. Nevertheless, some are continuing to prepare while others are just going about their daily lives. As Israel deals with the aftermath of the October 7 attacks and still faces threats on all sides, the United Nations takes little notice. Israeli Ambassador Gilad Erdan criticized a new UN exhibit that highlights global victims of terror, but omits any mention of Israeli Jews or the October 7th attack. There's not a single mention of any attack carried out by Palestinians against Israelis. We are about to mark one year since the massacre and the largest terrorist attack against Jews and Israelis since the Holocaust. Yet the UN does not think it needs to be displayed on its walls. What the world doesn't understand is that this is a spiritual war fought in the physical realm. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan hates the Jews with a passion. He hates them because God provided both the Bible and the Messiah through them. He hates them because God called them to be his chosen people. He hates them because God has promised to save a remnant of them. He hates them because God loves them. Satan works overtime to plant seeds of hatred in people's hearts toward the Jews. He is determined to destroy every Jew on planet Earth so that God cannot keep his promise to save a great remnant. He tried to annihilate them in the Holocaust. He failed. He will try to destroy them once again during the last half of the tribulation. He will fail again. The nationwide air raid drill that's carried out every year to better prepare the country in case of an attack from North Korea was held this afternoon. Air raid sirens blared across the country at 2 p.m. on Thursday as South Korea held its annual air raid drill. During the 20-minute drill that was carried out to raise public awareness of emergency response measures, Pedestrians on the street were required to move to designated shelters or nearby underground spaces. Traffic was blocked in some areas, including downtown Seoul, as drivers were instructed to pull to the side of the road while traffic lights remained on red for five minutes to allow passengers and vehicles to safely evacuate. There are about 17,000 shelters across the country, installed in places such as apartment basements and subway stations. Also during the 20-minute drill, the country's Air Force carried out a training exercise, simulating an attack involving an enemy fighter jet. F-15K, F-A-50 and T-50 fighters took part. Thursday's drill was carried out on the last day of the four-day Urzi civil defense exercises, held alongside the ongoing Urzi Freedom Shield drills, which South Korean and U.S. troops began on Monday to boost joint readiness against threats from North Korea. During this week's civil defense drills, the defense ministry said it held a meeting to discuss the nation's response measures in case of a nuclear attack from North Korea. In the meeting that involved the military and 11 different government agencies, 
They reviewed the country's defense posture against a possible nuclear attack and discussed detailed plans to support chemical, biological, radiological, and medical units. Meanwhile, military officials from Seoul and Washington have been watching closely for a potential provocation from North Korea. As Pyongyang has been strongly criticizing the Uzi Freedom Shield combined exercises, calling them a rehearsal for an invasion. Breaking news from overseas, Ukraine launching new drone attacks inside Russia as troops push deeper into Putin's territory. Another night of drone strikes inside Russia and Ukrainian troops advancing on the ground. And I think they don't want to so much march on Moscow, but they do want to instill fear and discontent from the borders to the very heart of power at the Kremlin. Overnight, Ukraine launching more drone attacks on military sites and fuel depots deep into Russia. <laughs> Video verified by ABC News showing smoke rising from one airfield hundreds of miles from the border. And a fuel storage site hit by drones five days ago still burning today. Meanwhile, Ukraine releasing more images of attacks into Russia's Kursk region. Its troops still pushing their shock offensive. It's chaos right now. I spoke with an American fighter in an exclusive interview just returned from the battlefield inside Russia. Why would an American want to go into Russia illegally? We're here to help. We're here to try to end authoritarianism. Photos like these, the stars and stripes on Russian soil, will likely outrage the Kremlin. The American says he was there advising a sniper team. Talk me through that first moment when you crossed over the border from Ukraine to Russia. What was it like? The energy in the Ukrainian side and the lack of energy, the vacuum on the Russian side. There's no heart in the Russian Empire. We're not naming the US Air Force veteran over his concerns of retaliation, but have verified his identity and these photos he said he took inside Russia. One final thing I think we've got to keep in mind is that although it's going well for Ukraine there, it's not going well here. Russia is advancing. Military sources telling ABC News this morning that Russia, uh, that Ukraine, sorry, is low on troops, ammunition and equipment. It seems as though we are on the verge of World War III. Jesus told us in the last days there would be war between the nations. Are we seeing the stage setting taking place to fulfill this prophecy? If so, then we're close to the time Jesus refers to as the worst time in the history of the world as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. If we are that close to the tribulation, then the world is about to see war the likes of this planet has never seen before. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal, war will be unleashed. Resulting from these wars will be famine, pestilence, and death as Jesus breaks the third and fourth seals. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion meaning two billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to four billion. The signs of Jesus soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers 
Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.